All right, welcome to another Open Atrium 2 webinar. Um, I'm Mike Potter. I'm the Open Atrium lead architect here at Phase 2. Uh, and today we're going to try more of a Q&A format. I can go through some of the kind of top features in Atrium uh, if we'd like, but I'd like to keep this one a little bit more interactive. So we're going to use the, the GoToMeeting uh, question bar. So if you have a question, um, expand the question area and you should be able to type your question and I'll see it over there and we'll start uh, collecting those. Uh, so as uh, we, as we, as you know, we've been uh, uh, releasing Open Atrium 2 on Drupal 7. It's now in beta. So at our last webinar, we were a little bit pre-beta. Uh, it took a little bit of effort to get it out there. I think we're on beta 3 now, trying to get it to install properly everywhere. Um, we're actually working on a, a new beta, so you'll see a beta 4 early next week. Uh, the Panoply guys released a new RC5 version of the Panoply distribution, and so we're now working on getting that working with Atrium. And there's a couple issues uh, with that right now, so if you've been installing the, the dev version, you've probably run into that. Uh, there's some issues with the navbar module right now that's stopping the, uh, the admin menu from working. So if we go to our demo today, we'll have to kind of uh, step carefully around some of those issues that we're still working on. Uh, but hopefully I'm, I'm expecting we'll get that resolved early next week and we'll get a new beta out for everybody that will, be, that will have the, the latest version of that, uh, of that Panoply stuff. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, so I'm gonna start by taking some, some of the questions that uh, have already been posted and we'll see how far that takes us and, and where we wanna drive from there. So the first question is from uh, Alessandro, and he asks, can OA2 be set up for bilingual usage? Which is a great question. Um, basically what we're doing with Open Atrium and uh, multilingual is you, you won't see anything out of the box for multilingual, um, but we're trying to support all of the Drupal mechanisms for multilingual. Uh, so for example, on a typical multilingual Drupal site, you're gonna wanna install uh, some additional modules like the internationalization module, the uh, I18N, I18N uh, is the internationalization module. Um, that will help do a lot of the, the things that you need for translation. We do support just the kind of normal Drupal translation in, in coding Atrium. We've tried to make sure that we use the the T function, for example, that, that does translations. So in terms of translating Atrium, we're definitely open to people doing that. It should just be a matter of providing some uh, some of those string, you know, the .po files that Drupal uses for string translations. Um, and we'll be able to, to host those for, for if people want to, uh, to provide those and, and help the community with that. Um, with that said, we haven't done a lot of testing of that. That's something we'll be doing during beta. Um, so if you're interested in helping to test that in uh, multilingual situations, um, definitely contact us um, via our email that we'll, that we'll show at the end here, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get you involved in making sure that, that things get fixed. But in general, treat this just like any other Drupal module. If you find issues, post them to the issue queue on drupal.org for the Open Atrium uh, distribution, and we'll try to get some patches and, and get things fixed up there. Uh, I know there's definitely a lot of issues involved in that. I know people that have done uh, organic groups in the past have run into issues. So, you know, some things may may not be things we can fix directly in Atrium, but hopefully we can help patch the, the relevant modules and the stuff in Panoply or, or whatever is needed to, to do that. But the reason we don't provide that out of the box is just because there's an awful lot of modules and extra things needed that uh, that people who don't need multilingual uh, would not necessarily need. And so we're trying to leave that as kind of a separate uh, separate piece. If it turns out that we need to have something like a, you know, a OA underscore internationalization kind of helper module uh, to turn things on and probably configure it, um, I'm definitely open to, to doing that in the future as well. Uh, so that's multilingual. Uh, next question is from Jen. Questions about documentation uploads. I'm using the version from Pantheon, and I could be wrong, but it looks like the only content types available for basic users are wikis and discussions. Uh, I recall that you can add a pane to show files um, that have been attached to wiki discussions. What about spaces that are just for file sharing? Uh, not looking for advanced document management like Alfresco, but still want simple file uploads. Uh, can you recommend that with a custom content type? 
Walk us through setting up a space to allow creating uh, documents and discussions. Okay, um, let's see. In addition, uh, hopefully, in addition to wikis and discussions, you should also have events. Events is the third plugin uh, available. Uh, so hopefully that also shows up in your content types um, on Pantheon. If not, definitely let me know. Um, but as far as documents, um, the way we do documents is, it to us, it doesn't make sense to simply have a file. Um, because with a file, all you have is a file name. You have no other information about that file. So you're always going to want to wrap your files with some kind of metadata content type, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you want a place where you can give the file a title and a description and some keywords and, and that kind of thing. And so that's why you actually want to attach your document to one of these content types. The content type that we use for that in Atrium is the wiki uh, content type. And it's called OA Wiki. I think we've tried to rename it recently to just call it document page. Um, but basically, like if we pop over to, uh, to Atrium really quick here, yeah, let me see if I can get my, my Mac to work here. Okay. Uh, so for example, here we are uh, in the physics department. And we've seen this, uh, if you've seen demos before, you've, you've seen me use this. If we go into our kind of documentation section here where we have uh, uh, research and resources, and, and I apologize for the fact that the uh, screen, uh, the image there is not showing up. Um, but what, what you do here is you would go ahead and you would create a document page. So here's where it shows that it's actually named document page instead of wiki page. Um, so you would say, you know, um, this... Let's call this the you know project uh, specs or something like that. So you would give your file a name and say uh, this file contains the project specifications. So here's where you're giving kind of your meta description uh, for the file, and then you go ahead and you upload the file. Uh, so you go to select and oh. Does, looks like our Panoply has broken our media. Oh, no, there we go. It's just, just taking a while. Okay, so we choose file. Like I say, we're kind of in the middle of this semi-broken uh, atrium release here with the new... Uh, uh, see, I probably shouldn't show all the files on my, my system here. So let's go ahead and go quickly down to OA. We'll go grab a PDF file, for example. So let's grab our bad camp PDF. So we'll upload that. Let's say next. We're going to put this in the private file system for security. And we're going to say this is the project specs. And we're going to save that. Okay, so now that should give us this document. So let's go ahead and publish this. Now, as you, as you mentioned, you don't now get that media view. So you, you've got the project specs now posted in our, in our space. So if I go back to our uh, resources here, you'll see that we've got this new document. So you can imagine, um, you know, as you do this, you're now going to have a whole bunch of these documents. And you can see you've got the download link, <clears throat> you've got the description and the, and the title here. <clears throat> if you then want to use that, that media widget, that media widget is currently only designed to show you uh, the media within a particular node, and it's really meant actually for the discussions. So right now it's meant to show you kind of all the different media attached to all your discussions and replies. Um, it's not going to show you all the media across, in this case, like all the different documents here. But you could do that with just a regular view. Um, and maybe we'll try to do something to, to enhance that document widget so you could actually drop it, for example, on this page here. Uh, but for now, like if this was, um, if instead of a PDF, if I, have, if I uploaded like a video, you'd actually see a preview of the video and stuff here. So for now, you would just use this. And, you know, if I wanted to download the file, you know, I click on it here and, uh, and you can see the, the light box pop up. And then I can click it to actually view the PDF uh, within my browser. Uh, or if it was like a Word document, you'd be able to, to download it there. So that's all we're doing with files right now. So you're basically just creating this kind of metadata wrapper um, around your files. Uh, hopefully that made sense. Oh, good, we're getting lots of questions. Um, so if you need a follow-up to that, uh, feel free to post. 
Okay, let's see. John says, this, um, as some of us are not totally familiar with Atrium 2, can we? Uh, can you post your last webinar link? Okay, sure. Um, so that's actually a good generic question, John, that I'll answer just a little bit differently, uh, which is if you go to uh, drupal.org slash project slash open atrium, um, this is one resource uh, as developers, if you're used to Drupal, uh, this is where we have the project page for Atrium. And on this project page, I've linked to all, all, a lot of our various webinars. Uh, we've been doing them for a while now. The, the beta preview one I did a couple weeks ago is here. Uh, these different demo ones focused on certain features where we went a little bit in depth. Um, and then the one in May is, is fairly general. And of course, that was before we were even alpha. So it definitely evolved as we uh, as we developed Atrium here. But uh, that has a list of the latest webinars. Um, we also link to some other modules that are working with Open Atrium uh, as well. The other resource page to go to is uh, the products.phase2technology.com site. And this site is actually built using Atrium. Uh, we haven't updated it to the beta yet. We're working on that right now. Um, but you can uh, see the three different distributions that Phase 2 supports. And if you click on Open Atrium from here, you go to the Open Atrium uh, documentation area. And over here on the right hand side, uh, you can click on documentation and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being uh, built out here. And we're adding to this all the time. So this is all the kind of free documentation, both from a how to user guide, you know, how to create spaces, as well as for developers, you know, how to create some plugins and, and more of the technical details on, on how you uh, enhance and expand uh, Atrium functionality. Uh, so those are two really good resources to uh, to look at. And as I said, we'll be expanding that over time. So let's see, Keith asks, uh, I noticed that when creating and editing a space, you can change the panelizer view mode using a taxonomy drop-down selector. Can you lend an insight as to how do you make that happen? It's pretty neat. Uh, sure, yeah, this is something uh, that we enhanced fairly recently, actually. Um, and what, uh, what Keith is talking about here is, let's go back to our physics space here, for example. So if I, uh, let's go into the calendar, for example, calendar section. If I edit this section, uh, once it comes up, uh, okay, so here's our calendar. Come on, server, be nice. Okay, so here's our calendar uh, for the physics area. I currently only have some holidays imported from Google on this. But if I edit this, uh, this calendar section, one of the fields for every section is what type of section it is. And so down here below the, the, the body, we have this field. It should say section type instead of just section. Uh, but you'll notice here's the different types of sections that we currently ship with. So for example, when we were looking at that documentation uh, file posting, we were in a news section. The news section kind of gives you a display that looks more like a, a listing of blogs. A discussion section is going to give you more of a topic-based listing like forums. And of course, the calendar section is showing us the, the calendar and everything. Um, so via this taxonomy, what this is doing is if you click this override defaults uh, uh, checkbox here, you'll actually see what it's doing. As you change, and I'm not, I don't think it's going to update live here. Yeah, it, it only updates when you first come in. But basically, by filling in calendar section, it has filled in the panelizer layout for us. So in the past, you, you changed this directly. You actually changed the panels layout. But we wanted to kind of add some additional functionality. For, uh, for the first part, panelizer default doesn't really tell people anything. That's kind of geeky, and it turns out to be very hard to change that, that text. But we also want the section to know automatically what types of content can be created within that section. So for example, in this case, a calendar section knows that you can create events within the section. Um, but let's say you wanted to, you know, if you were doing a discussion section, you'd want to create, you know, discussion posts. Uh, and so the way we bundled this together is through taxonomy. So if I go to our admin, structure menu here, and we go down to taxonomy, 
you'll see that we've added a couple taxonomies, and one is for section type and one is for space type. Uh, ignore event type. Event type was uh, something I used in a demo last week that's a space-specific taxonomy. But section and space type are the two kind of global ones. So let's take a look at this section type. We'll list the terms here, and you'll see those three terms that we just saw before, like the calendar section. And if we edit the calendar section, what we've done is we've added some fields to taxonomies. In Drupal 7, taxonomies are entities, and you can make them, uh, you can add fields to them. So we've added two fields. We've added a, a layout field, uh, which is here. And then we've added this set of node types. These actually aren't really node types. These are uh, what we call command buttons. And using the command buttons module, you can create your own um, listing of links here. By default, it creates a command button for every content type, for creating that content type. Uh, so this is, so it's this taxonomy that you're selecting on a section. And then when that section is selected, it's taking this layout field and it's assigning that to panelizer behind the scenes. So this is how you're kind of indirectly getting that panelizer uh, setting. Uh, what this means is it's really easy now to create your own uh, section types. So for example, you don't have to create your, your own panelizer type. Uh, let's say that I wanted to create a new section that had the same layout as discussions, but I wanted to allow you to create events and discussions, you know, and maybe uh, document pages. You know, I could create this as a new taxonomy term and name it, um, and, and I would be able to then have sections that, that use this uh, taxonomy. Or, of course, if you, in Panelizer, create your own Panelizer layouts, those would show up here as options that you can select. We do this for both sections and spaces. So, again, it gives you just a, a better way to do templates and kind of decoupling us a little bit from the Panelizer-specific stuff. So that was probably way more information that you wanted uh, for that, but definitely dive into the uh, Command Buttons and Away Buttons module, which is where all this stuff is done. Okay, Alessandro, is there a wiki feature now? Yes, the uh, the document page uh, feature that I mentioned is our, our wiki. Uh, so when you're, you know, basically all a wiki is, as far as, far as I'm concerned, is it's a, a way to either uh, publish uh, information or encapsulate some kind of file and then place it into a hierarchy and also potentially use some kind of markdown language. So for example, in this case, I created this project specs uh, document, but I didn't actually link it into the menu. Uh, to show you how that works, if I go to back to this project specs document that we created and we edit this, if I wanted to put this into my wiki hierarchy, I just say provide a menu link, and I would say project specs. And you have this thing called the group menu uh, and this is basically for the section. I'm in the Researches and Resources section. So let's say we wanted Project Specs to show up under, I don't know, Particle Physics or something. Uh, so we would save this. And now, in addition to just being listed, you'll see that it's now, it's now shown over here under the, uh, the menu for this particular section. So if I go back to our, our landing page, you can see it's on the menu there. Um, this does have some... Um, uh, there it is actually project specs. Uh, this has some DHTML menu stuff that's uh, currently right now needs a little tweaking. You'll notice that instead of expanding when you click on the icon, you have to kind of put the mouse a little over to the right. So we're going to fix that. But basically you can expand and collapse this, this menu hier hierarchy. So we use that, for example, on the documentation site over here on the, the product site to show this, this hierarchy. So this is basically your, your wiki space. Um, the other function of a wiki is to have some kind of uh, markdown uh, language. And I don't know if I've got it enabled on my demo site here, but basically, nope, it's not here. There is a module that you install that's called uh, OA Markdown, and just enable that module. And it adds support for the markdown module, which just will add another type of editor. So right now we have a WYSIWYG, we have like an HTML, uh, uh, you know, basic kind of tag editor. And then Markdown would give you that kind of wiki, uh, wiki-like uh, markup language ability. So that's uh, that's really all there is to it. I mean, you know, a wiki is just a set of linked documents, and you know, with the even the WYSIWYG editor, you know, we've got this Linkit module that lets you search for content. So if I wanted to link, for example, to one of our other uh, uh, resource pages, um, 
you know, I can do that right here. So I can just like insert a link to that. Uh, and then there's the, you know, there's the, there's the link to that page. So in terms of easily linking to pages, uh, you know, we've got that functionality uh, with the link it module as well. So that's what we're doing right now for, for wikis. It's not, you know, obviously going to be the best in class wiki solution that you've ever seen, uh, but it, it gets the job done. Let's see, Jen asks, uh, I have a question about the create content button in the admin menu up top. I recall from a previous webinar, but not seen it in my instance in config settings. Uh, so that's this button up here. Uh, so this button is only going to exist. This is a context sensitive uh, create button. And you saw me using this, or you saw how it kind of works with section pages. So what it does is it looks to see if you have any sections in your space that accept content. If you're just up at the space level itself, um, by default, it will give you options for creating a team and creating a, a, a new section page. Uh, but you'll see that things like event and discussion posts and document pages, those are coming from the sections. So for example, because the calendar section says that it accepts events, the create event button shows up for the space. And when I create this event, it's gonna actually get created within the calendar section. So it's smart to know exactly where content should be created. Uh, but if you don't have a space set up yet, there's, there's nothing to tell it what needs to be created. So you initially would go up to a create new space, uh, create your first space, and then you should see that on your page. Now, let's see, with that said, I do recall seen some issues where that wasn't showing up not too long ago. Uh, so you might also try updating, make sure you're on the beta three. Um, but I think in beta three, this, uh, this should be there. Um, but definitely feel free to follow up in the issue queue. Um, if you're constantly, if, if you're not getting the plus button, um, we can try to debug it on the issue queue and see if maybe there's some, uh, some bug coming in. Uh, obviously you also need to be a logged in user who has permission to to create content. It's only going to show you content types that you're allowed to create here. Uh, so yeah, it's dynamic. If you're if you don't have anything to create, that's it's going to disappear. See, Tim says, I'm still a bit confused about pages, spaces, and sections. I created a sample site and the home page shows sections. Can you explain how ordinary content pages fit within sections? Sure. So so yeah, the let me go to a particular slide here to help with this concept just a little bit. So the idea is that instead of in the old OA where your content lived directly within your group, or in this case within your space, uh, we created this concept of sections. And you'll see we've used that for things like your discussion section or your calendar section or your documentation section. So sections are just a grouping of your content um, you can set us. You can set a default layout to say, you know, I'm creating a calendar section, in which case it's going to let you create events. But you can really create any content type you want. And again, it's from that uh, drop down that I showed you where you can override the defaults. So if you edit your section page, like if I wanted my event section to allow more than just events, um, I could edit my event section and, and for example, have it allow uh, discussion posts. And then create discussion post would be an option in that add content menu. Uh, so that's kind of where spaces and sections fit. Space is kind of this top level landing page for your whole, you know, department or your whole uh, office or, you know, whatever kind of grouping you have for your little microsite. And then sections are kind of the functionality areas under that. In the old Open Atrium 1, you had the tabs across the top, and that's basically what sections are now. So before you had tabs for things like blog and notebook and event calendar. Um, those are called sections now in Atrium 2 because now you can have more than one of them. So you can have more than one blog or more than one notebook or more than one event calendar. So ordinary content pages. So you know your, your best guess or your best thing to use for ordinary content would be that wiki uh, or the again, the document. That's why we renamed it to document page. So you're going to use document page for any kind of just generic content, anything that just has a title and a body field and optional attachments. Um, things like events have you know special fields for event location and time. Uh, discussion posts have special fields for 
doing replies uh, to have a whole discussion thread. So discussion posts and events get a little bit more complicated, but the document page is kind of your simplest content type. It just lets you put basic content within a section. So, so try to use that. Um, there is a content type um, called, instead of calling it document pages, there's one called content page, which I know is very confusing. The content page comes from Panoply, uh, and we've left it enabled. Basically, the content page has no knowledge of spaces or sections, and it's intended to be used for kind of these top-level pages, like your, you know, About Us page, you know, something that you're going to span, you know, outside of this whole spaces issue, something that's going to be global for your site. So just be a little careful using content pages. Um, they're going to be public. There's no way to make them private. So everybody will be able to see them. They will exist outside of all your spaces. So anybody from any space will be able to see them. Uh, so you don't really want to use that for space uh, content. You want to use the document page uh, from Atrium for that. All right, so that was Tim. Uh, John asks, how beta is beta more of an alpha 7 versus uh, beta 3? <laughs> okay, sure. So um, you know, I've talked, I talked about this a little bit the last time, but what does beta mean? So, you know, beta still means buggy. Um, and, you know, we all know there's always going to be bugs. Like, you know, even when this is a release 1.0, it's going to have bugs. I don't know of any Drupal module or anything out there that doesn't still have some bugs and some issues in their issue queue. So, so none of this is really related to bugs. Um, what it is related to is what I call stability and, and functionality. So in beta, we mean that the functionality is now basically complete. So you're not going to see uh, a brand new, uh, uh, you know, plug-in or anything like that. You know, we've got discussions, we've got events, we've got uh, documents. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I also did a blog post about beta, uh, which, which also goes into this uh, that I can point you to in a minute. Um, but basically, these are kind of the key, the key elements. Is beta means that we've completed basic functionality. So, uh, so you're not going to see a lot of new plugins coming out uh, for now. We're focusing on this stability. It also means compatibility moving forward. And this is really important. In the alpha stage, it was the Wild West. Like, we were breaking things every day, and there was no backward compatibility. You could go from, you know, your site working to your site be completely broken, and there was no update hook or any kind of, you know, way to move your site forward. That was, that was alpha. In beta, we're committed to compatibility. So, for example, if you've got beta 3 installed today, when you install beta 4, it's going to still work and you're still going to have all your content and all your spaces and all, and all of that. We'll provide, if we do change anything, you know, behind the scenes in terms of, you know, database formats or stuff, we'll provide update hooks to make sure that all your stuff uh, gets migrated seamlessly so you won't ever even see that. Um, so we're not going to be breaking sites. Um, now, there's still the dev release. So, like, for example, today my demo site is on the dev release and, you know, the admin menu, for example, the nav bar stuff is broken because of the latest Panoply update. So a dev release can still be broken, but if you stick to the actual beta releases, then you'll be pretty safe. And you can actually start developing sites now on the beta releases uh, and be sure that we're not going to trash your data or anything like that. Uh, so that wasn't the case in alpha. Uh, the other thing is we finally, we've got, uh, you know, the function, the, the automated test in place so that when we release a beta, we'll generally know um, if it's going to install properly. Uh, we've got documentation released. And so it's now really intended for site builders to start playing with. It's not really intended for end users who want an out-of-the-box, you know, base camp kind of uh, solution where you just want to go get an account on Pantheon and start using Atrium. It's not really kind of there yet. That's what the public release is for. So what we're working on for the public release is is getting things like the, uh, let's see, I think I talked about that. I don't think, maybe I didn't make a slide for that. Um, so for the public release, we're working on things like the demo content so that when you install Atrium, it will kind of guide you through what to do next. Right now, if you install it, uh, like on Pantheon or off Drupal.org, it's kind of like, um, okay, now what? Like you get this blank page and you don't know what to do and it's kind of hard to see how you create a space. So we're, we're going to be using something like the Joyride uh, JavaScript stuff to give you some little pop-ups to tell you to create a space and then create a section and, and do that kind of stuff. We're going to try to provide a, a sandbox mode 
so that you can create uh, demo content that's not going to be real content so that once you're done playing in the sandbox you can turn that off and start creating your real site uh, without having to reinstall everything uh, so we're going to be working on stuff like that so you know less building features and event modules and more you know cleaning and polishing uh, we need to do a lot of work on the, the mobile ready side like right now when you start shrinking the screen the toolbar doesn't collapse properly so there's some mobile ready stuff to do we're also going to be starting to get some uh, some scripts together for migration of oa1 data uh, for some of that so we'll be working on that um, so just a, a lot of those kind of things going forward but but hopefully that helps answer the question is what the, what's the difference between beta and alpha it's, it's really that backward compatibility uh, moving forward and that uh, we've completed the functionality uh, even though there's obviously still some uh, some bugs in it let's see kelly asks uh, how can i get a section page to show up in the navigation bar when i'm on a section page i see it in the nav bar when i'm on the space home page there's no sections in the drop down beneath home so the nav bar let's see let's go back to our little demo here uh, so up here across the top um, in in the beta we we did uh, replace the nav the, the the old nav toolbar with this new kind of smart breadcrumb uh, the old nav bar is there if you want to install it but the breadcrumb uh, tries to do things a little bit better so what you've got here is that you've got your home button within your home page you then have a space kind of your parent space so this is showing us we're in the physics space but our parent space kind of one breadcrumb back is the physical sciences school and if i click on that i'm taken to the physical sciences space and now you can see the parent for that is just the generic schools so just like clicking on breadcrumbs i'm kind of going up the breadcrumb list the last thing in the breadcrumb is always kind of your section navigation so within my school space right now i don't have any sections uh, the drop down for schools now shows me the the children spaces so i can go back to physical sciences and then from physical sciences i can navigate down to physics so you can see the breadcrumbs kind of bi-directional and then once i'm down at physics where it says home here this is my uh, section so your section page should show up here within your space uh, where it says home that's actually customizable text now you used to say space home now it just says home that's the home for your space which should not be confused with the home page of your actual uh, website itself so when you're on a section page like if i go to you know student discussion you'll see that this changes to say i'm in student discussion but i can go back now to the the home page of my space uh, using that drop down so you can always navigate your spaces uh, or your your sections there now in addition on the space landing page we currently have the list of sections over here on the right hand side is a menu um, but that's kind of replicating uh, this list as well so they're kind of duplicate ways of navigating obviously when i go down into a particular section I lose this menu on the right because now I'm just seeing stuff for the section. Now I could customize the section, I could add that menu here, but again, since it's along the top, it's not, not really as necessary. So hopefully that explains. Um, so anytime you create a section page, it will automatically show up in this uh, drop down as long as you have access to it. Obviously, if I was logged in as a student, I would not see access to a faculty discussion. That would, that would not be visible. Right now I'm logged in as the admin so I can see everything. So they should always show up in there. Let's see, Dirk says, can Shoutbox or similar microblog be added to OA2 without coding? Uh, great question. So yeah, we don't have Shoutbox in the core product, um, but basically integrating any Drupal module with Atrium now is very straightforward. Um, I'm gonna actually go over this a little bit in more detail. There's gonna be a Drupal Association uh, webinar in a couple weeks. Um, on August 21st. Yeah, August 21st. Um, so uh, the Drupal Association, we're doing a, a webinar for them. What I'm going to actually do in that webinar is go through how to create a, a new plugin for Atrium without writing any code. Uh, I don't know if I'll do a shout box or something. Uh, I haven't actually picked what kind of functionality I'm going to add yet. Um, it might be FAQs. Uh, but basically, I want to do something where we either create a new content type or we take an existing Drupal module and integrate that into Atrium. 
But if you go to the documentation on this uh, phase two uh, products.phase two technology site, down here under uh, community plugin toolkit, it talks about how you add um, section awareness to content types. So if you go get the shoutbox module, uh, for example, you'd want to have a separate shoutbox per, per project or per space. So you would want to add the, uh, the space field to that, the OG group reference field to that. Um, and, and that would allow you to do space specific stuff. Um, we also have space specific configuration. So there's a very, there's a module called OG variables and that lets you, if I go over here to the config menu for the space, um, we'll click config. Um, this is basically the, the group. It, it's also called the group menu in organic groups, but we're calling it config here. Any module that adds any kind of configuration will show up here. But in particular, we have this variables uh, support. And what you can do is you can define any uh, system-wide variable as being uh, as having different values for every space. So in this case, I selected the site name and email address as being uh, variables that can be customized. And so that's why when I'm in the physics space, the title of my site is actually physics department instead of open atrium uh, demo. So for example, if Shoutbox had uh, a global configuration as to like where the Shoutbox goes, what you would do is you would go into the, your, uh, your admin config, uh, and this is probably a little bit more detailed than you want, but if we go into slash admin slash config, there is your variables. Typed it right, variables. Okay, so there's this module called OG variables. And when you go into that from a system config, now it's showing you here's all of the different uh, categories of configuration information. So in our case, in site information, we checked the site name and site email. But, you know, we could have also checked site, site slogan. Um, you know, any of your system variables that you might want to customize are going to show up in here. So if, and this is for any module that uses the variables API. So if Shopbox is using the variables API, its configuration should show up here. Uh, and then you can just basically check this box and then you'll be able to have a site specific information for that module that will change as you go from uh, space to space on your site. Um, but in general, if there's a Drupal module out there, you know, adding functionality, 90% of the job is writing the Drupal module. The last 10% is getting that module to work with OA2. It's very easy. Can't necessarily promise that you can do it without coding for something with, like Shot, Shotbox, but you can do an awful lot of stuff without coding these days. Let's see, Keith then asks, with parent-child relationships, it appears permission inheritance flows in one direction. Is there an easy way of reversing that flow? I would like a member of a child space to automatically have the same membership privileges to the parent space group. Is there an easy way to achieve that? Um, unfortunately, Keith, right now it only goes in one direction. Um, that's the OG subgroups module. It's actually very tricky to handle bi-directional. Um, there's ways to kind of change your architecture a little bit where you would create kind of a separate group for your access control and then assign that group as the parent of both your, your top level space and your child space. Um, so you can do it that way. Um, but like, like I say, when you start going backwards, you end up with information architectures that just kind of kind of break. So I would maybe take a look at look at that and see if there's a different way to refactor it. Uh, in Atrium, it's always just going to go one way. We do have a, a toggle where you can control whether um, admins inherit their admin access or whether they actually become just regular members when you inherit them. So that way, someone who's the admin of the parent doesn't necessarily become the admin of the child. Uh, they could just become a, a regular member of the child. Um, but right now it does all just flow down that way. Uh, Jen asks, how do you set display of section pages within a space in the top navigation bar, the drop down? See, I think this is this a repeat. Drop down link to the right always says space home even when there are sections in the page. Um, if it's not showing up there, uh, Jen, what the way I would debug that is I would go into your uh, section, like let's go into faculty section here, faculty discussion, um, and edit your uh, section page and go down to the very bottom and there is this collapsed area called space. Um, expand that and make sure that the 
the space, in this case, it, it says your groups, but this is coming from the organic groups module. This is really saying what space the section is a member of. Uh, so just make sure that your space is selected here properly. It's possible that somehow your section page got created without this getting auto-filled. Uh, normally this gets auto-filled based by what space you're in, but if, you know, if it says none, then it's obviously not going to show up anywhere, or maybe it's setting, maybe it's showing up in a different space somewhere. But as long as that's set to your space, and as long as you have access, um, it pretty much has to show up in this uh, drop-down up here. So, so just uh, double check those couple of things. Let's see. Uh, another Jen says, uh, "Okay, document page makes sense. So that's a follow up to the uh, to the document types." Uh, John, what server strength is needed to support OA2? What rules of thumb are there to help size servers for OA2? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, we are trying to keep OA2 pretty generic to Drupal 7. Uh, so, in that sense. You know, Drupal 7 has got its own, you know, list of requirements. So just make sure you fill all those in terms of your PHP versions and stuff like that. Um, we do recommend setting your PHP memory to at least 256 meg. Uh, I believe the default is only 128. So we do have a lot of modules, and the more modules you have on a site, the higher your memory needs to be. We're trying to keep it at 256. I have seen cases where if you start installing some other modules or start building new features uh, on top of Atrium, we've had to bump that up to like 384 uh, meg. But 256 meg should work out of the box. That's what I have people do when we install Atrium uh, locally. Um, the only other thing we've had is if you install Atrium on a Macintosh, and you're using the MAMP stack, M-A-M-P. Uh, the MAMP stack has the MySQL setting for, uh, I think it's max allowed packets set incorrectly. Uh, so you need to bump that up. Um, we'll try to make sure we have a documentation, documentation uh, page set up for this kind of stuff uh, so that you can look at that. But in general, it's not gonna be anything uh, more than a regular Drupal 7 site. So that kind of just defers the question to, okay, well, what's how do you help size a server for Drupal 7? Um, my typical recommendation for production servers, it's it's really gonna depend on your site and your audience and you know how many hits you expect, uh, you know, if it's a public site uh, versus a private site. Obviously with Atrium, you're dealing with a lot of logged in users. So your resources probably are gonna be higher than that than a typical public Drupal site. On a public Drupal site, you're gonna be doing a lot of caching with things like Varnish for anonymous users. And that kind of caching isn't really gonna help you on Atrium because all of your users are gonna be logged in users and they're just gonna bypass that Varnish cache. So because of that, I really recommend that production systems be on their own dedicated um, uh, server, whether that's a, an actual dedicated box or whether it's a dedicated VM. Uh, don't try to, you know, put um, 10 Drupal sites in one VM instance. Um, I typically recommend uh, a minimum of two gigabytes, preferably four gigabytes of RAM for your VM. Um, you know, dual CPU cores are good. I mean, that, that's kind of getting into kind of geeky stuff, but it's, it's, it's not what I would call heavy requirements. Um, just recognize that, you know, this is going to be your production site. Uh, you're not just going to run it on, you know, somebody's Mac or, or PC somewhere. You're going to want, you know, a dedicated hosting environment that really understands how to run Drupal and understands what things like memcache and, um, you know, APC and varnish and those kinds of things are. See, Keith says, uh, since OAE relies so heavily on features, I'm afraid to update to newer versions for fear I will overwrite configurations I've been doing since. Can you ease some of those fears? Would I just need to enable the overrides and leave everything else alone? Um, so yes, we definitely, <laughs> I'm also the maintainer of the features module, so I'm pretty pretty aware of our use of features and, and how that works. So the, the best way to do uh, feature overrides is actually with the features override module. So if you find yourself overriding something on your site, that is marking one of your features as overridden. Uh, like let's say you're using the uh, OA discussion uh, module and you need to make some change to the discussion content type or something like that. Um, and so now your, your feature is overridden. You definitely want to resolve those overrides because yes, the next time you update and revert your features, you could easily lose your customizations. So what you do instead is you uh, install the feature override module, which is actually part of OpenAtrium, so it's there by default. 
what the feature override module lets you do is take those overrides that you've manually made to your database and create a new feature that contains your overrides. And all they contain is the overrides. So when the base feature is updated, your overrides should still apply to that. So for example, let's say you were changing the name of a view. Um, and so as soon as you change the name of the view, that feature that contains the view is marked as overridden. But all you're doing is changing you know, the title of the view, and that shouldn't be that hard. So you go to Features Override, and it will detect that override. It will let you save that new title to a new module. So now you've got your new module that's called you know, My Title Override. And now when you update the original feature, your override is still going to apply and will still change the title of that view, even if the original feature has changed a bunch of stuff. So that's kind of the proper clean way to handle um, adding functionality and overriding features. We've tried to keep things pretty modular so that the amount of overrides in Atrium 2 should be much, much less than, for example, in Atrium 1, where, where things were tied a lot more together. Uh, so hopefully you will fi won't find yourself needing to do too many overrides. We are aware there's some issues with things like the permissions right now, um, which are being done with features, and we're probably going to switch to using default config or something so that those won't be sitting on your site, because obviously things like permissions, you're, you're going to override on your own site, and you don't want to have those things necessarily have to have override modules. So we're going to continue working on that in the beta. But oh, take a look at features override. I think that will help you a, a lot with some of those problems with features. See, Nicholas uh, asks, is there a possibility you can reconsider your decision about work tracker that should come from the community? It would be great if that module was included from the start, given that many use it in OA1, um, and plug-in module developers use it as the basis for their modules, such as Time Tracker and Scrum. Yeah, Nicholas, I, I understand the concern that the problem is it's not just the work tracker, it's, it's really case tracker itself. Um, if we wanted to be able to migrate people from OA1 to OA2, uh, we would really need the case tracker module. In OA1, the case tracker was really the big module that was not built for OA1. Um, you know, it was a separate Drupal module out there in D6. Um, the state of it in D7 is still rather uh, unstable, I would say, at this point. So, you know, I'm not comfortable putting that in Atrium. I know the guys are working on it, so, you know, maybe that will be a case someday. Um, the Work Tracker is a good module that uh, David Snowpick wrote uh, that we linked to our uh, Open Atrium page. That's another good issue tracker, but you know that's a separate module. It's not necessarily going to have any compatibility with Case Tracker. So again, there's not necessarily a migration there from OA1. Um, you know, we're we're trying to move Atrium more in terms of a framework for adding functionality instead of trying to do everything out of the box. So as things like Case Tracker come in, uh, and there's an Atrium 2 version for that, you'll be able to install it. But we're not necessarily going to put it in the core product because it's, you know, it, it handles the use case of some people, but not everybody. Uh, everyone kind of has their own needs when it comes to issue tracking. Some people are tracking software bugs. Some people are just need a to-do list. Uh, and so Case Tracker didn't even really fit those needs very well. Uh, people were kind of forcing their needs into the solution at that point. And I'd rather see that there be, you know, several different options for Atrium 2, you know, be it a to-do list module, you know, a full issue tracker module, uh, a Jira plugin module for people using Jira, you know, those kinds of things rather than trying to force it into a, a single solution. So, so basically, no, at this point, you're not going to see that from us. Um, it's also, you know, a resource question. We've, we've poured a ton of resources uh, to releasing a free version of OA2 for the community, and we're just limited at, at phase two and how much more we can keep, uh, keep doing that. So it really does come down to the community at this point. Okay, more. Boy, we're getting tons of great questions. And here I was I was worried we were just going to have dead air. Okay, Jen says, great, that makes sense. Um, didn't want to use wikis for it. My users are familiar with wikis. So, yeah, hopefully changing it to a to document page instead of wiki will uh, will make that better. That's actually why we changed the name. Uh, and good, we got some people saying that answers my question. Uh, Dirk asks, how can a member of a space add a wiki doc link to a menu only for that specific section? Um, so I think I showed that. So when we edited that document, when I put it in the menu, that menu is only showing within the section. So every section has its own menu. So when I say provide a menu link here, um, when I go down to my group menu, um, you're seeing within this group menu, here's my different sections. So I've got, you know, the project, the research uh, space. Uh, so every section has its own part of the group menu. 
you're only going to see menus for your space here. That's what group menu means. So like, I'm not going to see the space menu for some other, you know, like the humanity space here, but every section shows up here. And when you're on the section, it's only going to show you the menu items within that section. So when I'm on the research uh, and resources section, it's not showing me any of this, uh, this project stuff up here, for example, that's in a separate section. So it should already be doing that. Just using the normal Drupal menu options there. See, Ralph asks, do you happen to have the work tracker module installed somewhere right now so we can get a quick look? I don't actually have it. Um, again, I, I would just you know, install Atrium and then go to the, the uh, work tracker page and just install it like a regular module and take a look at it. I do hope to get a, a better look at it here in the future. I've just been uh, so busy with Atrium core work that I haven't had a chance to, to fully scope that out yet. Let's see, John asks, can you mention some live uses of OE2 in the wild? Uh, well, you know, one is our product site here, which we're, you can see it has the old, uh, the old toolbar on it. So we're getting ready to update this to the latest beta uh, next week. So you'll see that change. Um, we just finished doing a very large site build with OpenAtrium2 um, for uh, an organization called the, uh, it's AHRQ, which is the, is, I think it's the Association for Health Research and Quality or Quality and Research. Uh, it's an internal health IT uh, organization within the U.S. government uh, that's working on things like meaningful use within electronic uh, medical records and things. Um, so we just built their site using Atrium2. It's a nationwide community-driven site where they have lots of little local communities discussing uh, meaningful use in digital health records. Uh, that went very well. Uh, they just launched it actually internally this week. Um, and it, it's using the OA2 beta. Um, so like I say, a very, very large site, unfortunately, because it's private to them, it's not something I can show as a public reference. You know, that's kind of the pros and cons. You know, Atrium is really great now for um, kind of privatized content where you want to discuss projects and stuff internally. And so while you can do public stuff, um, we haven't seen a lot of uh, use cases for that yet. So if you have a site out there, definitely let me know. Like, uh, you know, email us at the open atrium at phase two technology.com. Whenever you have a new atrium site, we would love to see what people are doing with atrium. Um, but that's the only projects that we've, that we've currently done here in phase two. We have some others in the works, uh, but that one, uh, that one did launch and is, is out there. Uh, it just can't, can't be seen by the public, unfortunately. Let's see, Holly asks, I was not able to update from alpha five to beta three. Seems it has issues with spaces I'd created. Kept getting a fatal error dealing with classes. Is beta four more stable? Uh, can I, and can I expect it to work on my site? If so, what method of update would you recommend? Does it need to be reinstalled? Um, okay, so yeah, so this goes back a little bit to the beta question. So yeah, we never, never guaranteed or promised that you'd be able to go from alpha to beta. Uh, that was what alpha meant. So, so there was not an upgrade from alpha five to beta three. Um, so I would get, you know, if you're, you know, familiar with Drupal, um, basically that class error is because things moved. So because modules moved in locations, your old alpha five site is looking for them in the old locations. Uh, and so it can't find the PHP class files. The way around that in any distribution, including OA, is there's a drush command called registry rebuild registry underscore rebuild. Um, it's Drush RR. But do a search on drupal.org for the Drush registry rebuild. It's something that you have to download. Uh, it's a custom command for Drush. So your version of Drush might not have it by default. <clears throat> but what that does is it tells Drupal to rebuild its uh, system registry, which tells it to go rescan where files are located. Uh, and that will typically fix problems with uh, things moving around. Um, but that's really what we were trying to finish up going to beta is we tried to finish all of those module moves. So they shouldn't be moving anymore. Um, if they do move, we'll provide the update hooks to, to fix that in beta. So as you go from beta three to beta four to beta five, and then to public eventually, um, all of that will get taken care of. But from alpha to beta, um, there was really no way to easily handle that for people. So apologize that it broke things, but you know, we told you that alpha was probably gonna break things. So hopefully it uh, wasn't a big problem. Uh, and then let's see, it says, I like the menu tabs being in the upper right corner rather than the header area. Oh yeah, that's a, another another new thing if you haven't uh, noticed lately uh, that we did, if I go back to like our physics space, uh, we got rid of the Drupal tabs. So you're used to on a content page having the tabs along here for like view, edit, 
um, revisions, you know, whatever it, it had. And we found that that was just kind of taking up a lot of space. Um, and the, the specific site we were building for the ARC project had some more menus along the top. And so there was all these horizontal ribbons and that was yet another horizontal ribbon that we tried to get rid of. So uh, we created this module called Contextual Tabs and it collapses the Drupal menu over here to the right. So under this little config gear you see, here's all the tabs that you would normally see. Um, it's able to pull tabs out as separate buttons. So the edit tab gets pulled out as a separate button. Uh, the members tab is pulled out as a separate button, but all the other tabs that would normally be across the top are collapsed. Uh, and then it also adds the uh, visibility widget so that you don't necessarily need to have it uh, full in your face uh, here like it does right now. And this is customizable. So when you're on a different page, like when you're not on a space page, if you're just within a particular section where there's no members tab, uh, now the members tab is gone and now you just have the edit tab. Um, and then the normal tabs. When you're actually editing a page, then the edit button, the, this is the normal view button, so you can rename buttons. So in this case, we're renaming the view tab to say cancel. Uh, and you'll notice that the edit tab is no longer listed as a tab because it knows you're on the edit page. So it just tries to clean up the Drupal uh, tab system. So yeah, we were, we were pretty thrilled with that uh, kind of UX improvement. Let's see, we're probably going to run out of time here for people's questions, but I'll do the best we can. How Dirk asks, how can command buttons be made into horizontal tabs? Um, right now, um, you'll need to do some theming work for that. Uh, there is a little bit of help in terms of we have, if I go back to my physics space here, um, if I go to customize this page, whenever you have any kind of menu, like this section menu, um, you can go to the style, and we have something called bootstrap menu styles. And if I say next here, I can uh, change this to be tabs um, or anything that I want. I can save it. Uh, let's see, that's let me move this up to the top of the page. Uh, so you can see when I moved it to the top of the page, now if I save as custom, so I've just customized my space and I've just turned that section menu into a set of horizontal tabs along the top. So now I can go to student discussion. Now the problem is that only happened to that space page. So now when I'm in student discussion, you know, I've lost that navigation ability. Uh, so it only happens when you're on the space page. Uh, however, for example, when we did the ARC site, um, we just customized the uh, theme template for the ARC site so that this um, space menu that you normally see when you're on documentation always shows up at the top of the page. So you can use your space or your group menu to show up as a secondary navigation. And then instead of seeing all of the sections, you can kind of pick and choose uh, what sections go in that menu. Uh, but again, that's something you're gonna have to do kind of at the theme layer, unfortunately. Uh, Brian says, can you demonstrate the versioning capabilities of the wiki? Yeah, um, that's just using the normal uh, Drupal versioning system. So if I go back, for example, to my document that I created uh, and where my project specs here are, and we'll say edit this. Um, so you'll notice in publishing options, there's this create new revision. So we can say uh, this is new text. And we can say this is, I added some text. And so when we save this by default, it is creating a new revision. Uh, and again, this is standard Drupal revisioning. So if I now go over here to my uh, config tab, we go to revisions. Um, we can now see, here's all the revisions. Here's the current one where I added some text. Here's the previous one. You can compare them. We can revert to a previous revision. We can delete revisions. So you have a full revision control log here. Um, in addition, when you get stuff posted to your activity river, um, you can see here up at my main space, you can see that it says the admin, the admin updated this and added some text. And we do a little bit of diff configuration here. So it, it actually, when you expand this, the added some text is our revision message. And then when you expand it, it actually shows specifically, you know, hey, this is the stuff that changed. Um, if you have notification emails turned on, you would get an email that has this uh, same information. So, uh, so yeah, full, uh, full revision support there. What it's not doing is it's not going to do revision on any attached files. So in this case, it's still that same PDF that's attached. If I had a new version of that PDF, I would have to reattach the new version of the PDF uh, to the document. And that's where it's not a real document management solution uh, because it's not handling that. Okay. 
see. So yeah, Jen, I'm going to ask you to, you know, since we can't really debug on the uh, the screencast here, um, I'd ask you to to try the issue queue for that if you're still having a problem with your uh, sections not showing up. Um, so then the question is, I assume search doesn't search within attached files. Yeah. Um, so right now we do support Solar. Uh, so in the search box at the top here for the site, uh, where you can search across your space or across users, uh, we're using um, the Panoply search module here, which means it will use the Drupal search um, or it will use Solar, and you just have to configure the Solar server. So if you go into the uh, configuration section for Drupal, you'll see that the search API module is there. You can just input your Solar server and it will start using Solar for that. Now, Solar itself still isn't going to necessarily search the contents of your document. Um, you're going to need to have some technology available to do that. Um, that's why you put the metadata in the, the wiki document, is the metadata, like your body field and your title and your keywords, that is the stuff that's going to be searched by both Drupal or Solar. Um, it's not going to dig into the actual file itself unless you have some special modules or technology installed on your site that would let it do that, like to scan a PDF or something. Um, yeah, and if you're using uh, Acquia, the Acquia hosted solar, that actually should still be fine. Um, it, the Open Atrium doesn't care where your solar server is. So if you've got a solar server set up on Acquia, you can link to that as well. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, Dirk asks, how are site pages added next to the top level space tabs? Um, so uh, what you're asking there is basically how you, how you can customize this. What we've done on Arc is we added um, the main menu uh, up here. So I think I've shown this in the past, and I, I don't like I say I don't have my admin menu to go show you a bunch of admin -y kinds of things. But this top level toolbar is a mini panel. So if you go into your site structure and go to mini panels, you'll see that there's an OA toolbar and also an OA footer uh, mini panel, and so, for example, you can drag or, or you know, click the Add button and add your main menu block to it. And then that would put your main menu up here. You probably have to do some theming to make it appear on a different line. Um, but then what you do is you would just put your site pages in the main menu, just like you would normally do on a Drupal site. So there's nothing different here from any normal Drupal site that you would build. Uh, you can still support your main menu and your secondary menus. You just need to add them to this mini panel. Right now, the mini panel just has the... Uh, the breadcrumb and the search and the add content kind of stuff in there, but that's all customizable. Uh, let's see, let's see. It's uh, the the rename. So Jen asks about the rename from Wiki to Documents. Um, that I believe is in the beta three version, uh, so it should be in beta three. Uh, Tim asks. So let's see. So he says, so should I create the home page as a content page and make all spaces children? Actually, what we recommend is we actually recommend making the home page another space. Uh, it's basically like your global space. Um, it can be just the home page. Like right now, if I just go to the home page, this is just a panelizer page that I can customize. It's not even actually a node. Um, it's just something that we you know, created via a customized page, and we just dropped some widgets here, and we made this the home page. Um, but what I've seen with a lot of sites is that they actually, for example, here, there's no indication that I'm, you know, really on the home page. Um, you know, when I was in physical sciences, there was this parent level page called schools. Uh, so I could easily make the schools page my home page by just going into the Drupal uh, configuration and saying, you know, my home page is slash schools. And then you could customize this as well. The advantage of making your home page into a space is then you could actually control the access control for that and the, the whole access hierarchy for that um, because it is a space and so it has uh, all of its members and access. Let's see. Uh, Edward asks, uh, how do we know what plugin modules are compatible with OpenAtrium? In previous demo, <laughs> work tracker was mentioned. Excuse me, but is there a source that lists everything available? So on the Drupal.org page, I've tried to list two sections here. Um, one section shows the official OpenAtrium 2 projects. So these are the modules that are officially part of the distribution. And you'll see it has uh, the wiki and the discussion and the events uh, and those kinds of things as well. And then down here is other modules that work with Atrium 2. So we wrote uh, LDAP integration that's out there on Drupal.org. Here's David's work tracker. 
Uh, there's some work going on converting the old Ginkgo theme. Uh, and then there's the organic theme module, which I have vetted uh, as officially working with Open Atrium 2 in the sense this lets you add a separate theme for each space. So I've tested this. So as we test modules that work with Atrium 2, we will list them here. Um, I'm, you know, if it, if it eventually gets out of hand, I might have to move them to a different page. But if you know of something that's working or if you write something, uh, let me know and I'll list it here. I'm happy to list stuff here. Uh, in the section up here, you'll see kind of the stuff that we're officially supporting in terms of patches and issues. Uh, whereas the ones down here, you're a little bit more on your own uh, using those. Okay. Chris asks, what sort of time frame for the improvements in beta is just detailed? So uh, in turn, you'll see constant beta rollouts over the next few months. Uh, like I say, I'm working on beta 4 right now, and you'll see beta 4 next week. Um, in terms of when you'll see the public release, that will be sometime this fall. Um, but you'll see betas come out uh, you know, pretty much every few weeks. Uh, it's just a matter of when it gets to a point where it's good to release. Like in this case, we have the new Panoply uh, release that we want to tie to. So that was a good time to do a, a new beta release. Kelly asks, let's see, so section pages don't show up there. So yeah, so we got some debugging to do. Uh, Jen asks, uh, can you talk about notifications? What are the defaults for basic members? What configure options are there for changing the defaults? Uh, for example, are they automatically going to receive notifications for any content added to the space that their group or team in? Can they change that to only certain content types within the space? For example, can they get a digest? Okay, excellent questions. Um, the basic setting, if you go to your dashboard for your user, your user has up under the config menu, your user has a settings page. And in that settings page, uh, there, there may be more settings here eventually, but there's this notification section. And each plugin can define its own notifications. So you can see here that the event plugin has its own events, uh, the discussion plugin has its events, and then open atrium messages is where the kind of global atrium messages go. So for every type of message, you can control it on a per space basis. So by default, everything is checked. So yes, when I just updated that piece of content, it emailed everybody that was a member of that space, uh, or that, that I had notified, anyone that I set up a notification for, which I'll get to in a second. So if you were scheduled to get a notification, it would send you that email. But if I came here and I unchecked it, that would be saying, I don't want to get emails for updates in the faculty space. And you can see there's buttons up here saying, I don't want to get any updates, or I don't want to get any deletes or I don't want to get anything for the chemistry space or anything for you know, the physics space. So these kind of buttons help with that. So this lets you kind of control the spam at an individual user level. If I go back to the uh, physics space in that uh, project revision I was working on here. So in this project specs, um, every piece of content has this notification box. So when I'm editing this, for example, when I was doing a new version of this document, uh, and I go in here and I say, this is another new version. It's going to notify the people that I select here. So right now, nobody's getting notified when I select this revision. Um, but I could choose to say, let's notify everybody in the faculty, um, or let's notify you know a specific user. Uh, this is kind of like the checkboxes that were at the bottom of the form in OA1. Now, in this case, it's not notifying everybody in the faculty group. It's only going to notify people who are in the faculty group who are a member of my space. Uh, in this case, it's the physics space. So only physics faculty would get notified here. Um, you can also notify any teams that you've defined within your, within your space. Uh, so this is how you control it. Now, once you set this, it's going to remember this. So if I save this, And then, um, and now you can see in the notifications, this is now all shown as notifications. When I now edit it again, and you can see notifications were just sent to three users. When I edit it again to, to you know, update this again, you can see it's set by default to whatever it was before. Now, if this is just a trivial update, you can click, click this box that says don't send notifications. Um, and now if I save this one, it's not going to notify anybody because that's a trivial update. Uh, so you can see it didn't notify any users. So that's how notifications are done. Um, they do have defaults. So at the space and section level, you can set up defaults for the space and section so that any new content 
would automatically get the default notification. So if you always want to notify your project team, for example, you can make that the default for your space. Um, in terms of digest, digest is something we're working on. Um, we're using the message API module, which is what's used also in Drupal Commons and also in Commerce Kickstart. And they don't provide a digest functionality yet. Uh, I think we're going to try to work on that here for Atrium, and we're trying to do it in a way that would be kind of a general purpose digest module for the message API so that it's something that people could use in those other distributions like Commons and, and Commerce. So it's a fair amount of work. Um, we haven't gotten started on that yet, but that's something I, again, hope to get done during this uh, beta phase. But right now, there are no digests. Uh, God, at some point, let's see, are we going to get done? Okay, let's see. Steve Muncy, how is taxonomy used within a space? So uh, we have a module called, uh, there's a module called OG Vocab. So if I go back to my space configuration, you'll see there's a taxonomy area for my space. Uh, this is how I created the event type. So I created this new vocabulary by just saying add vocabulary. So event type is now a taxonomy that just exists for the physics space. So, and it's only currently enabled for events in the physics space. So for example, when I go to my calendar and I go to create a new event, you'll see that the event form has a field down at the bottom for event type. Uh, where that taxonomy is located. And if I was in an event calendar in some other space, I would not see that. That's a space-specific taxonomy. So yeah, we have full support for, for taxonomies. Uh, let's see, John asks some more about uh, size recommendations on servers. So yeah, John, feel free to, to uh, ask that in the issue queue or send us an email on more specifics there. But again, it's really going to depend a lot on your specific site needs and, and audience. Uh, will OA2 be offered as a service through phase two or other? We're definitely looking at that. Um, certainly for now, uh, we've got a relation with Pantheon to do uh, one-click installs uh, for hosting. So you can get on there very easily. Uh, you still need to, of course, kind of be a Drupal person to do that. In terms of making Open Atrium into more of kind of a SaaS platform to be like a base camp, uh, that's definitely something we're considering. And I would kind of stay tuned for uh, for information on that uh, through the through the fall. Uh, Mark asks, is there a way to add revision control to document pages? So I showed that uh, revision control is on all of the uh, content types. Okay, any discussion of OA? So John asks, is there any discussion of OA2 in Drupal 8 yet? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, as, as you can probably imagine, Atrium is a lot of modules. I mean, we've, we've got organic groups, we've got the media module, you know, we're based on Panoply, we've got panels, we've got a ton of modules uh, in Atrium. And so in order to release that on a new version of Drupal, we would need all of those modules to be available. So even though they talk about Drupal 8 being out soon, they're just talking about core Drupal. Um, it's going to take a while for modules to get caught up. And even though you have things like some part of views in core, not all of views is in core. So there's still probably a views module that needs to exist. The organic group module would still need to be updated. The media module still needs to be updated. Panel still needs to be updated. Uh, very little of panels has made it into Drupal 8, unfortunately. Uh, so there's a lot there. Um, I'm guessing it probably takes at least a year after initial release for those modules to get out there. Um, we wouldn't be doing Atrium unless that was fairly stable. So you're probably looking at a year or two after D8 release to where things are stable enough to do an Atrium. In that, in that regard, however, we have architected Atrium 2, uh, looking forward to Drupal 8, you know, being aware of what's out there already. Uh, that's why we chose panels, for example. Uh, so we are trying to do things that will make this easier in the future so we don't have to do another rewrite. I, I really, really don't want to have to rewrite this again for Drupal 8. Uh, so the, the plans are, are there, but they're in the far future. Uh, you don't have to worry about that for now. You're going to get a lot of good life on Atrium 2 on Drupal 7 for, uh, for years to come. Okay, have, let's see. How is taxonomy? Let's say we talked about taxonomy. Uh, can you make, uh, Her Her Hervé asks, can you make part of the site public for non-authenticated users? Yeah, definitely. So when, when you create spaces, uh, each space, and there's a whole discussion of this uh, in the documentation and in the past webinars, uh, so I'd encourage you to go take a look at that. But you'll notice here it says that we're in a public space. Uh, so this space is available for anonymous users. Anybody who comes to the site can see this content. 
when I go into a, a section page where I've controlled access, you can see it now says this is private. The only people who can access this are people in the faculty group. And if I click here and see right now, the only people in the faculty group are the English professor and the physics professor. So that gives you a private section on your site. So you have a full mix of private and public. And that's really one of the key strengths of Atrium is how it does the access control in a very robust way so you can mix public and private parts of your site. Uh, Turk asks, how you, can you explain how a user can be a space? How a user can be a space? Users right now actually aren't really a space. Um, they're members of spaces. So uh, we don't really actually use the concept right now of users being spaces. I know Commons kind of does something like that with organic groups, and I'm kind of looking at that. It's, it's a little weird um, with the Atrium use cases, but, but we'll take a look at that. Um, if I, let's see, Ping asks, I want to do a clean install of Atrium 2. However, can I move Atrium 1 to another directory without deleting it before installing OA2? Um, so OA2 is going to install as a new site, so um, it's not going to overwrite your OA1 directory. Just install it in a new directory um, and make it, uh, I mean, if you have a single domain, um, you know, I would put Atrium 2 actually in a little subdomain like, you know, mysite.com slash OA2 or something for testing purposes. Um, and do it that way. Actually, the best way to do a clean install, if you just want to check it out, is probably to go to the Pantheon stuff and do the, the one click there. Uh, it's free. So you can use that to kind of eval it. Um, the trouble is if you move your OA1 stuff to another directory, that could break your links uh, with your OA1 site. So just be careful with that. Uh, yeah, Jen. So yeah, it doesn't, does it notify you unless you select them? Is that only for revisions? So as I showed, there's different messages. So there's an update message for revision. There's a new content message. There's a reply message for uh, discussions. Um, that push notification only notifies if you select it. However, if you're looking at any particular content, like if I go back to that product specs document here, um, everything has a subscribe button. So if I was a user who was not being notified, let's say I was just browsing around and I had access to this, I could subscribe to it, and now it's going to add me to the notification list. Um, it's not going to show up here under users. It, it keeps track of that separately. And as a user, you can go see your subscribed content. So this is kind of like following something uh, or liking something uh, as you subscribe to it in Atrium. Uh, and now you're bringing those notifications to you, even if you weren't on the original uh, list. So both types of notifications are there. OK, I think we're going to have to go to the last question here. Uh, so Yuan says, I'm not sure I understand spaces, how spaces and sections are related. Do OA groups still exist? So yeah, and, and if you're used to OA1, um, the group has been renamed to space. And so in OA2, they're called spaces, but they are still the organic groups groups that you're used to in OA1. A section is kind of like a subspace, although we, we do support full subspaces. So you can have a full hierarchy of spaces and subspaces and sub-subspaces. But then a section is kind of at the very bottom level, it's kind of like a subspace with additional access control. So when I'm in a section, like this research and resources section, um, when I edit this section, I can specify who can see this section. So I can say that this section can only be seen by faculty, uh, or it can only be seen by this project team, or it can only be seen by a certain set of users. So a section is kind of like a subspace with greatly reduced uh, privacy or greatly reduced visibility. So I can have private areas within my site. Uh, so that's how, for example, in the physics space, which is like your old groups, uh, you can have some of these public areas and then things like faculty that are private or things like student that are private. So sections are kind of like the old features in Atrium 1. So in Atrium 1, you had the tabs across the top for you know, blog, notebook, events. That's what sections are in OA2. So the old features become sections. The old groups become spaces. Uh, and then in Atrium 2, there is also something called a group, but a group is really just an access control group. Uh, it's also an organic group, and it's a thing where you have members, but it's done for access control purposes, kind of like if you're using LDAP or other user identity systems where you have access control groups. That's what we use the term groups for, and that's a more common usage uh, in the industry. So that's why we changed it. 
is people outside of Drupal, when they see a group, they're used to thinking of an access control group. Uh, so we had to change it to something else, and we chose the word space. Spaces isn't the greatest. We've had a lot of discussions about terminology. That's what we uh, that's what we ended up picking. It. So, you know, sorry, it's a little confusing to OA1 users. Definitely go take a look at the other webinars that are out there on the Drupal.org page. It, it explains a lot of the terminology in great detail. Um, other than that, I'm afraid we have to cut on cut off the questions. Appreciate you all coming. Uh, this was a great, great question and answer session, a lot more than uh, than I expected. And I apologize for running long for people that had other things to go to. Um, but uh, thanks very much. And we'll do another webinar here soon. Uh, until then, we'll keep using Atrium and talk to you later.